just as yesterday that they've taken you away to be extradited to the USA. They say that it's to Sweden that they're gonna take you first, but the Yankees are pressing hard for revenge is what they thirst. Persecute your website and they'll kill your funding too There simply isn't anything that hesitates to do They've used bullets, napalm bombers to get rid of who they hate And they're willing to use all these things to seal up your faith You're listening to Clearing the Fall Speaking truth to expose the forces of greed with Margaret Flowers And now I turn to my guest, Joe Lauria. Joe is the editor of Consortium News. He's a veteran foreign affairs journalist who covered the United Nations for many years. Thank you for taking time to join me, Joe. I'm very happy to be with you, Margaret. So, Joe, today we're going to talk about Julian Assange. I think most people know who he is, the editor, publisher, and journalist with WikiLeaks, who's being held in Belmarsh Prison in the United Kingdom because the United States is pursuing extradition for multiple charges. Um, He has an important hearing coming up on Wednesday, October 27th. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. The the main thing to remember is that Assange won the extradition hearing back on January 4th. The U.S. has charged him under the Espionage Act. They've charged him with uh, conspiracy to commit computer intrusion. And uh, the hearing started in January, February of 2019, 2020 rather, and it was postponed because of the pandemic. It picked up in September and the ruling came down on January 4th this year. And She ruled to judge Vanessa Beretsa that Assange could not be extradited to the United States, not on because any of the charges that the U.S. were leveling against him were wrong or unfounded, but simply on health reasons. She ruled that Assange was suicidal, that he was at a very high risk of suicide if he were to be extradited to a United States supermax prison, which was part of her reason as well. The conditions of U.S. prisons were troubling enough to her that she didn't think it was right to send Assange to the United States to be held inside Alexandria in order to be tried there at the Eastern District of Virginia. That was a great moment of um, celebration for Assange supporters. She announced that he, she was discharging Julian Paul Assange, but then two days later, she put him back in prison, re- refused him bail because she said he was a flight risk. He, of course, had gone into the Ecuadorian embassy in 20. 20- 11 or 2012 in order to escape extradition to Sweden because of fears that he would be sent on to the U.S. And that was what borne out when the U.S. unveiled their indictment of him. So he's now still in Belmarsh prison. It's a, it's a very high security prison in London. And he is in there with some hardened criminals. He's simply on remand right now. He's not been convicted of any crime. He was initially there for skipping bail when he went into the embassy, but that has been served. He's there on remand. And of course, Assange's uh, supporters were happy that he won that decision on January 4th not to be extradited, but the U.S. appealed. Uh, They filed an application for appeal with the high court in London in January, and it took till July of this year, 2021, in order for uh, the high court to grant the appeal to the United States. And they granted it on only three of the five um, grounds that they wanted to appeal on. And the most important one that they rejected was the mental, the medical condition of Assange and the testimony, particularly of one defense expert, one medical expert named Michael Koppelman. They want to throw his testimony out on a technicality in which um, he withheld knowledge in his preliminary report to the court of uh, Stella Morris, which is Julian Assange's partner, and the two children that they had while he was in the embassy. They say that just by withholding that information from the court, he had misled the court, should be thrown out. So initially, the high court did not allow uh, the U.S. to appeal on the medical grounds. In other words, they accepted that it was not appealable what the judge had decided about his suicidal conditions and why she didn't send him to the U.S. Now, the United States did an unusual move after that. They appealed the the, the, the grant of appeal, essentially. So they were allowed to appeal only on a couple of other issues, but not on the main one, which is his medical condition. So they appealed the judgment of the high court. And in August of August 11th of this year, there was a hearing at the high court with different judges than the initial high court judges, which granted the U.S. appeal, but did not allow them to appeal the medical side. And this a judge, there were two judges, well, this judge decided to, with the United States that the U.S. could appeal 
the medical issue. That was a very big defeat for Assange because that's on the table now. And that is what's going to be the main part of the appeal coming up next Wednesday, as you say, a two-day appeal at the High Court in London. The U.S. is trying to prove that he's a malinger, essentially, which is what they alleged openly in court that he was back in the September 2020 extradition hearing, that they, he's faking it. And, and there were certain things that came out. For example, they tried to say that it was untrue that a razor blade was found in his cell and a cord. And uh, the, the next day, the defense produced prison documents showing that indeed a cord and a razor was found in his cell. So they have been trying to say he's faking it. The evidence goes against it. Even the British judge, Vanessa Barreto, in his extradition hearing, agreed that he's too suicidal to send to the United States. So now it's going to come down to a battle of this testimony of this Michael Koppelman and whether or not the U.S. can get the high court to overturn uh, the decision of Barreto that he's uh, too unwell to go to the United States. So they're going to try to prove that he's faking it. And that's really to, to boil it down. Now, what's troubling is I've learned just yesterday from the court uh, that the judge who was on the bench on August 11th that reversed the earlier high court decision that said the U.S. could not appeal the medical side of this, that that judge who reversed that in favor of the United States is going to be the judge next Wednesday. And that is very unusual from what I understand from uh, lawyers I talked to in, in London that the high court judge that made the decision in that case, now, neither the first high court judges, which said they couldn't appeal the medical issues and this second judge that said the U.S. could, and neither of those judges should be involved in the extradition. Here. There should be fresh judges to look at this. So the fact that the court is, a, is appointing this judge, uh, and I have an article up right now on Consortium News that talks about this judge, and he is uh, going to be on the bench there, and that's not good news. Now, apparently, Assange's team could challenge that, saying that he's not he's biased and he should not be on the court. But I don't know if that's going to happen or not. So that's where we are right now, Margaret. We're, we're gearing up for this extradition hearing. It's not going to be anything to do with the Espionage Act or any of that, which the Beretza, the, the, the lower court judge, sided with the U.S. on every side of that. Now, there's one other major story and one issue that has come up in the last couple of weeks that could figure uh, prominently in this appeal hearing next week. And that is the confirmation by Yahoo News that the U.S. indeed uh, CIA had seriously discussed trying to either assassinate or kidnap and rendition Assange from the embassy in London. This information came out in September 2020. Two witnesses in a Spanish court case against the owner of a Spanish security firm that was hired by the CIA and contracted by the CIA to spy on Julian Assange. This company, UC Global, Global, had been hired by the Ecuadorian government to protect Assange, to provide security. But the CIA was able to work with them and give them a contract to actually, in the end, set up real live 24-7 audio and video of whatever Assange was doing inside that embassy. So they spied, the CIA did, through the Spanish company, on Assange meeting with his lawyers, with his doctors, with Stella Morris's partner and anybody else who visited him in that embassy, but particularly the lawyers. The, clearly, this is a case where the prosecuting government, the intelligence services, the prosecuting government has eavesdropped on the defense preparations of the, of the person they want to get extradited with his lawyers, and this was not thrown out of, of the case. This is an extraordinary thing. But Rachel, in her judgment, said that was not an issue for her, that it could not be thrown out because of that. And more alarmingly, Margaret, is the fact that the two witnesses who from that Spanish case testified at Assange's hearing in September 2020 and talked about how an intelligence agency, which we later found out was the CIA, had seriously discussed killing him or kidnapping him. That we knew as early as September 20. That's evidence in this case at this point. It's already evidence in the case. It's not new evidence. On an appeal, it's very rare to put, introduce new evidence. This has to be evidence that was already uh, introduced into the lower court case. So we've got that. Now, what happened subsequently, of course, uh, at the end of last month, Yahoo News confirmed all of that, that testimony and added plenty of details about how CIA really, it was Mike Pompeo's operation to get back at him for Vault 7 release. These were CIA documents that WikiLeaks released. He's not charged with that, by the way. He's only charged in, with the 2010 publications of the Afghan uh, and Iraq war diaries. But when the when he put those CIA files out, the director at the time, Pompeo, uh, was incensed and wanted him killed or kidnapped. And they did discuss it at the highest levels. Now, the Yahoo story is based on numerous unnamed <clears throat> former and some current intelligence 
officers as well as uh, White House lawyers in the Trump administration. So there are some former Trump administration people who are not named. This is what this story did was to make it into the mainstream while we reported Conservative News and others what the court, what the those two witnesses had said in the court back in September 2020 about the plan to kill or, or kidnap him. That never broke into the mainstream, wasn't covered by the big papers. This Yahoo story did bring it into the mainstream. So the Assange's lawyers may want to introduce this into the hearing next, starting next Wednesday as a way of saying this is how suicidal he was. He knew that the CIA was trying to to assassinate him. This has to be admitted to prove even more his mental, what his mental state was and why the judge decided not to send him because he was suicidal. However, the judge, Vanessa Baretza, who was the initial judge uh, in the lower court case who didn't extradite him at that time in her ruling, where she denied his, extra, his extradition, mentioned and referred to this testimony from the Spanish witnesses about the plot to kill or assassinate him. And she literally says in her reading, I'm going to read you one line, that she essentially is sympathizing with the CIA, saying, uh, I have, I, I've even investigated this. This belongs in the Spanish court. I merely note here, she says, that if the allegations are true, kidnap or, or assassinate him, they demonstrate a high level of concern by the U.S. authorities regarding Mr. Assange's ongoing activities. It's chilling to hear this judge who let him go and then threw him back in jail pending the appeal didn't seem to care that the CIA was going to assassinate him or kidnap him because they were too upset about his ongoing activities. So he sort of justified that. If that's the mindset, Margaret, of this court, on uh, of this uh, high court judge who already ruled in August in favor of the U.S. being allowed to challenge the medical issues, then it could be a very long two days for Julian Assange. Yeah. And. I mean, we have to say at the outset that Julian Assange has not committed any crimes. He's just done what most journalists and publishers do, which is to reprint information that's leaked to them. This happens all the time. Major news outlets, you know, do this. So he has not committed a crime. There's so many problems with this extradition case. You know, the certain things that are required, you know, it can't be politically motivated. It can't put him at risk. It's clear that if the CIA is trying to kill him, if the United States government is trying to kidnap or kill him, he's not safe coming to the United States. Is is any of that, you know, these violations of, of the protocol for extradition, is any of that going to be allowed to be brought up or it's only going to focus on this health? No, well, I'm sure that his lawyers, Sandra's lawyers, will try to introduce this new evidence from Yahoo. And as you're absolutely right, uh, it seems like if Great Britain was dealing with any other country but the United States right now, and the person that that country wanted extradited from Britain, uh, could it was proven that their intelligence service wanted to, at one point wanted to murder this person? There's no way Britain would send uh, the, the requested person to the requesting country. There's just no way. But this is the United States. This is the U.S., and we know about the relationship between Britain and the U.S. It's very close, and it's very one-sided in favor of the U.S. So this is really troubling. They are going to try to argue that. Yes, how could you send Julian Assange back to Britain when we know that their intelligence services uh, at one point seriously considered assassinating him in the heart of London at the Ecuadorian embassy, steps from Harrods department store on the sovereign territory of another nation, Ecuador. They've considered seriously doing that. And uh, you're going to send him back to that country. So they could, the judge could say, well, this is newspaper gossip. This is not confirmed. There's no name sources. We don't know. Even though that testimony is already in the case from the Spanish witnesses a year ago. And we got just a lot more details from Yahoo now. So, and you're absolutely right to point out he's, uh, well, from our study of the indictment, he didn't commit a crime. He's been accused of committing espionage and computer intrusion, uh, conspiracy. But we've detailed this in numerous articles. And he is not guilty, of course, right now of any charge. He is charged, and he what he did was what he did was reveal crimes of immense magnitude by the United States and other governments and corruption. And this is why he's wanted, man, because you don't stand up to the United States and reveal what they're doing, what the mainstream media should be doing if they were doing their jobs, but aren't providing cover for U.S. aggression abroad, explaining it away as spreading democracy and all of the other myths that so many Americans believe because it's been drummed into us since we were very young about the greatness of the United States, its special 
character, its exceptionalism, and that it's the indispensable nation. And behind the cover of all of that rubbish that the mainstream media pounds into Americans day after day, the U.S. goes around the world pursuing its economic and geopolitical interests and having to sometimes eliminate huge numbers of people in doing that, taking down governments that won't obey, that won't comply, just from the power point of view and from economic interests and geopolitical interests. They have committed enormous crimes since the end of the Second World War, from Vietnam to Iraq and so many other places in between. And the mainstream media either cheerleaded for those wars or cover up what we find out later. And only reluctantly, like the New York Times apologized a year after saying, realizing there were no WMD in Iraq, that they did a poor job. But did anybody at the New York Times or the Washington Post editorial page lose their jobs? No. So they continue to provide cover for, for the establishment, for the intelligence services, for aggressive policies abroad. Julian Assange revealed those and didn't do it through uh, getting unnamed sources, but got the actual documents that were sent to him. He never stole them directly. That's what they'd have to prove. Joe Biden, when he was vice president in 2010, in December, went on Meet the Press and he was asked, are you going to charge Julian Assange? And he said, if we could prove that he went in there and stole it himself, then we have a case. But if he was just handed these documents, we can't do it. That's essentially what Biden said. And that's where they still are today. They cannot prove that. In other words, the Espionage Act of uh, uh, obtaining and disseminating defense information or classified information is technically, yes, it's in the, in the Espionage Act. It could apply to anybody, even a journalist. It shouldn't be in there. It clearly conflicts with the First Amendment. It needs someday to be challenged in the Supreme Court. But no one, no president ever charged a journalist for publishing uh, on, under the Espionage Act until Donald Trump, because even the Obama administration refused to do it back in 2011. They were trying to get him only on the fact, did he steal government property? Or was it handed to him by a source who stole it? It happened to be Chelsea Manning, an, an, an army intelligence analyst in Iraq who had illegal access to all of these documents. So there was no need to hack them. Assange did not help hack them. Then they tried to build a case of a, in a sting operation in the, in Iceland, where they took this guy who's been a, a jailed for pedophilia and he's a fraudster. And he went to the embassy in Reykjavik and turned himself in and said, listen, give me immunity and I'll help you. So he participated as an informant against Assange. But even then, I was in the Obama administration. They were unable to get enough evidence then to bring that computer intrusion or theft of government property, or that he was even a hacker. And that's what they tried to get him in a sting, to prove that Assange was directing hacking and participating in hacking rather than just receiving hacked documents. But someone else committed the crime to get them, but the journalist just received the material and has every right under the First Amendment, as, every, as you point out, everyday journalists do that, published classified information. That failed. They brought this guy back. His name is Sigador Thordensen. And he uh, went, the Trump administration brought him back again in 2019. They brought him to New York and to Washington. They talked to him and he supposedly gave this information that Assange uh, hack or was directing hacking. That was in the indictment of Assange right now. But as you might know, in June of this year, the uh, Stunden, a, a Icelandic newspaper, interviewed this guy, Sigador Thordensen, who admitted Everything he told the FBI was a lie, that he uh, recanted everything. So that part of their case has collapsed. They don't have a case to prove that he's a hacker, that he stole government goods. They can say that, yes, he disseminated classified information. But again, nobody has ever, no president has ever done this until Trump. It's a very weak case they have. And they're desperate to keep him and to get him. And they want to get him by saying that he's a malingerer now, that he's not really suicidal. He's not really that ill. This is what it's come to for the U.S. But you can't feel confident about this British judge in particular, or the court in general, given what I said about Baretta, her reaction to, at that time, learning that they were, there was a plot to assassinate or kill him. She basically said, well, the Americans were upset by his ongoing activities. It's understandable that they would want to kill him. This is what we're dealing with here. It's very, very troubling. Well, it's, and it's very dangerous, I mean, for press freedom in general. So the appeal was filed, you know, the you know, the Vanessa Barrett's decision in January of this year, the United States filed an appeal. Did that happen under Trump or did that happen under Biden? And, and what That's, is Biden's position now? Very good question. That was initiated by Trump just as his administration was winding down. It was a few days before the end of the Trump administration and the Biden administration came on. And at the time, NPR did an interview with um, the outgoing prosecutor in this in the Assange case. He was leaving government. And he said he didn't think that they'd probably go ahead with it. It was just a matter of resources. 
And he didn't think the Assange case was high up on the list. But guess what? They're still pursuing it. Even Joe Biden, who said in 2010, if we can't catch him red handed and stealing government documents, we really can't do anything against him. He's now, of course, the president and he's not dropping the case. He's, it, it is an Espionage Act case. He didn't believe in that then. I don't think personally he does now, but something happened between then and now. The 2016 election, even though Assange is not charged at all with anything to do with that or the CIA Vault 7 release, that turned Democrats so against Assange, wrongly in my view, that it would be heretical for Joe Biden, ahead of the Democratic Party, to now say, well, we're not going to pursue Assange after all. We're going to drop the case. I think it's a purely political calculation there. I, he didn't believe he should have been charged in 2010. I don't think he should be charged he, that he should be charged now, but it's too risky for him to go against what the Democrats feel. And why do they, I say it's wrong? Because, you know, the best thing would have been happening if Assange got Trump and Clinton documents and released them both. There would have been no question then. The fact is, Assange didn't get any Trump documents. He was looking for them. He says so in that film by Laura Poitras Risk. There's a scene he's on the phone. He's telling somebody we have some Clinton documents. This is early on. And but we, we think we're getting some Trump documents. They did get some Trump documents. They were checked out and they checked out to have been published already. They never got the material. So if you're a journalist and you get uh, damaging material, that's true. You've checked it out. It's accurate. It's absolutely verified. You get these materials that you will will inform the electorate about an election, about a candidate. Do you withhold those because you don't have documents against other candidates as well? You just can't. You, that's suppressing news. Of course, you want both. Both candidates were horrible. So you wanted to get hard, dirt on Trump. There was a lot of dirt that did come out on Trump anyway, but not from WikiLeaks. He had to publish them. It was a duty. The other issue is this was not the, the theory is that the Russians stole these documents, the DNC and Podesta emails gave them to WikiLeaks, and WikiLeaks wanted to damage Hillary Clinton, wanted Trump to win. There's nothing further from the truth. If you hear Assange speak, he disliked both candidates equally. He said it was a choice between gonorrhea and cholera, something like this. So he didn't have Trump documents. Now, I argue that even if Russia, and I don't think there's been proven that all that Russia, it's, it's in the indictment by Mueller that the GRU RU agents stole the documents and under the persona of Gustavo Tuporno gave them to Assange. We don't know who Gustavo Tuporno is. We don't have proof yet in a courtroom that it was the Russians who hacked those documents because that indictment will never go into a courtroom because those GRU agents will never be extradited to the United States. There's no treaty between Russia and the United States, extradition treaty. Uh, Mueller knew this. Uh, they built a case. It's never been proven in court. It's an allegation right now. Nothing more. Too many mainstream reporters talk about it as if it's been a conviction that the Russians were convicted. But I argue, even if the Russians did take those documents, it doesn't matter because the materials were true. And they've proven true when Debbie Wasserman Schultz and other high DNC officials resigned right after the WikiLeaks first published these emails. It exposed Hillary Clinton giving those speeches to Goldman Sachs, exposed her for the callous politician that she is. And this is her fault. They shouldn't have behaved that way. It was revealed what they did. The Russians gave information if it was the Russians, and I don't think it's proven, they gave information to WikiLeaks, who published it as a journalistic organization. They didn't give disinformation to them to sabotage an American election. This is the way it's portrayed, that the Russians sabotaged Hillary Clinton's election because they gave disinformation. They poured disinformation. They did not. It was all true. It was published. Any news organization has a anonymous Dropbox that was pioneered by WikiLeaks. Today, they get stuff sent to them, documents. They don't know who it is. You don't have to know who the source is when you're getting documents because you could check out whether documents are correct or not. If you're doing an oral interview with someone as a reporter, yes, you need to know the motive of that person because you'd have to know whether to believe their word or not. But if somebody gives you documents, it doesn't matter who the hell gave them to you if they're true. Russians could put uh, stolen American documents into CNN's Dropbox and CNN doesn't know who gave it to them. They'll check it out. It's true. It's newsworthy. They publish it. Were they used by the Russians? No, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the if the documents are true. And this is what happened in 2016. But Democrats persist in blaming Assange, blaming everybody under the sun except Hillary Clinton herself for losing that election to a con man 
And this is what happened. But they're blaming Assange. So I don't think Biden will drop the appeal based on this is all my interpretation, my analysis. Of course, I don't know what's going on in Biden's head, but uh, and hopefully he will do still do the right thing. There's still a week left to drop this damn case. Right. And so and I, actually, you have a piece I should mention in Consortium News, what the Yahoo Assange report got wrong, which talks about a lot of how they perpetuate these myths around the whole Russiagate uh, ordeal. So Congress is supposed to be looking into this report that the CIA was planning to kidnap and assassinate Assange. Do you know what the status of that is? Um, well, at this point, it's only the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, that's Adam Schiff, California, who has told Yahoo News yesterday that he asked the CIA for information about this, and he won't say whether he got any information back or not. That's where it's at right now. It's a very preliminary stage. He's made an inquiry. What is this story all about? You know, is it true? What do you have to say about it? Will it go to hearings? Will it become a big deal? I don't know. What I know of Adam Schiff, he's a very hyper-partisan Democrat who was one of the major cheer, you know, cheerleaders for the Russiagate uh, allegations. And uh, he perpetrated all kinds of things that were, were way out there, and particularly in the impeachment hearing and other things that they said about Russia and Russiagate. This was Trump. He's, he's still going after Trump because it was the Trump administration that hatched this plot to assassinate or kidnap Assange. Or was it? Because I just discovered an email from 2010 from WikiLeaks that says that the CIA refused to confirm or deny in a FOIA, response to a FOIA request, whether they had plans to assassinate Julian Assange. It goes back to 2010. And the email says this is Obama era justice. Now, this film by Alex Gibney that's going around being re-released now, perfectly timed for the beginning of the uh, uh, of the appeal hearing next week to sort of smear Assange all over again, shows that tweet. That's where I saw it. Uh, but it cuts out the Obama part. And I was shocked because in light of what we've heard about now from Yahoo and what we knew from those Spanish witnesses, it was back in 2010 that somebody was trying to ask whether the CIA had a plan to assassinate Assange. 2010. So his lawyers could argue he's known since 2010 that he may have been a target of assassination. That that's how long he's been nervous about this, that the way on his mental state and why we can't send him to that country. And that tweet, I found the original one. And it's quite extraordinary to know how long this has been going on. That was Obama era. But of course, I'm saying if Schiff works at all on this, since he's now the, uh, the, the chairman, because the Democrats have the majority of the intelligence, House Intelligence Committee, he could push it because he wants to embarrass Trump. And I don't care. That's I don't care the motive, as long as he, they, we get some information about whether this really happened. And I suspect it won't go very far, because as you know, Margaret, the House and Senate Intelligence Committee's oversight have pretty much become rubber stamped since the days it was created in 1975, after the Church Committee uh, hearings and the Pike Committee and the Rockefeller Commission, all the dirt that we learned about intelligence agencies from the end of the Second World War. So these uh, oversight committees were created then to try to stop abuses, like trying to assassinate a journalist in a foreign embassy. Uh, so I don't know how far they'll go with it, but that's where it is now. But I'm not uh, really that hopeful that we'll learn more, but we could. Yeah. So it sounds like perhaps it could just end up being a performative type of, you know, could be. Oh, yeah, they have to say something. So things are not looking good. Um, I mean, we have to hope that that still have some hope before this trial. But what kind of pressure is, is there? You know, the Yahoo report did bring out a lot more of kind of corporate media Talking about this issue, what kind of hope do you have, or what can folks do, or you know, what are your general thoughts on well, where there's Assange a, goes yeah, from here? There was a 25 press freedom organizations that wrote to Biden two days ago, or to Mark, sorry, Merrick Golden, the Attorney General, asking him to drop the case. There is um, a number three person in the Justice Department by the name of uh, Gupta. I'm, I'm blanking on her first name right now. I wrote a piece about her the other day because she has a background at the ACLU. She is, and the ACLU has come out strongly in favor of Assange. She is a prison reform advocate. She's quite a liberal and a even progressive or a former activist lawyer. And she's number three in the Justice Department. She, her, her, she, her, she's allowed to walk into Gar Merrick Golden's office and advise him on any issue. She could lobby for Assange. Uh, we don't hold our breaths about that, but there's somebody from within because it looks like the external pressure is not working on the administration. But somebody from within, I think Biden is torn by this. I really do. I think he doesn't want to do it because of what he said in 2010. But uh, he's, he's in a bind because of the misconceptions about the 2016 election and the WikiLeaks releases. So 
my great hope is they drop this damn thing before Wednesday, but uh, they haven't, doesn't look like they will. And I'm really worried about the fact that the same judge that overturned the high court decision not to allow the U.S. to appeal to medical grounds, that guy who sided with the U.S. is going to be on the bench on Wednesday. He's a real establishment figure, grammar school, Oxford. He was knighted and he's in the Privy Council appointed by the Queen. This guy uh, is the kind of person, and Britain has their own motives against Assange. We know from the former foreign secretary who wrote a book, Alan Duncan, who said, uh, who described the day Assange was arrested from the embassy and what the celebrations that were going on inside the foreign office. So, and the MI5 and MI6, they all despise Assange because he threatens the good game they got going that's based on corruption, lies, and even war and massacres and war crimes. And that's what the establishment rests on. Not everyone in it, of course, but they'll do that if necessary to stay in power. And you don't want some journalists, some Australian, longhand Australian coming along and blowing it for them because we got the rest of the media pretty much under control. They, they're too afraid for their jobs. They want to kiss our asses to get access. We're okay with the mainstream press and we can pretend we have a free media. But this guy comes along, actually does the work of journalism. He has to be thrown in a dungeon, maybe for the rest of his life. And if that doesn't undermine the whole concept of a democracy, I don't know what does. That's what's at stake here. It's not hyperbole to say that democracy really is on trial in this case, because if they can get away with throwing a legitimate journalist to really expose their crimes, then we're finished because uh, what they've got is a population that's distracted by numerous ways and lied to and propagandized so that they don't like Assange. They hate him as a person. That's the thing they focused on, the personal demonization, old trick of intelligence agencies or, or political attacks is to go after the person, not what he did. So they've turned a large part of the public against him, not only Democrats, and this is what's damaging. Without the public pressure, they could get away with throwing this guy away forever and being considered a hacker and a thief and, and all these other terrible, and a rapist in Sweden. That's something else we didn't get into, which has been thrown out three times in Sweden, never been any charges against him. This is the way to smear him and hope that the public doesn't get behind him so that they could throw him away and get away with it. And it's not seen for what it is, which is a so-called democratic country throwing away a real journalist for publishing truthful information about the crimes of the United States. And that's what they cannot permit. They cannot permit this guy to do this. And this is what we're, this is the point we're at. If he gets away with this, it's an enormous victory for, for, for the press. And if he's not it will be not understood by the vast majority because the media won't cover it that way, but it will be one of the worst moments in the history of the last two, 300 years of Western so-called democracy. And again, I don't think it's hyperbole to say that. Yeah, That's no, why we've spent so much time on this case. It's not hyperbole at all. And so is this kind of the be all end all? If the judge decides that he can be extradited, does he get extradited or does the defense have any options at that point to continue to protect Assange? There are options for I understand. First of all, I don't I've heard that the judgment won't come down to at least Christmas or maybe after that. If Assange loses and the US is able and they say that he uh that the, the judgment of the lower court judge was wrong and he can be extradited, he can appeal to the US UK Supreme Court. And that might take another six, seven months. They they want him languishing there, it seems like. They like him there. John Shipton, Assange's Father said the other day on a webcast that we uh, that we live streamed that uh, they're trying to murder my son. They want him dead. Uh, that's what he thinks. So the longer he stays in those conditions, the weaker he becomes physically, mentally. Uh, he's certainly gone through an unbelievable deal that most of us could never put up with for a week or two, let alone the years he's now suffered this. So they will try to go to the UK Supreme Court. Now the court could say no. After that, his lawyers can go to the European Court of Human Rights, but Britain has in the past made numerous statements that they do not find their judgments to be binding. So if, if the Secretary of State, the uh, sorry, the Home Secretary in Britain agrees and the court case, the uh, Brace's decision not to extract is overturned, he could be sent. I would think that that wouldn't happen until sometime uh, next year. But if the Supreme if the Supreme Court takes the case, but it could be more of the same charade that's been going on in this whole really absurd theater of supposed to be justice that we've seen. And this is what well, I'm hoping doesn't happen on Wednesday. But how could anyone not think that he's, how could anyone think rather that he's going to have a fair process next week? We have to hold out hope, but everything in this case has gone wrong and unusually, and he's not won anything except his right not to be extradited on the health grounds. And then the court allows the US to appeal that. It's just extraordinary. Look, nobody knows until next week. And we are, we have to hold out hope that he will be 
freed. But then, of course, the U.S. would appeal to the U.K. Supreme Court. So he would not be released from jail then either. If that's the case, he's going to be in prison till into next year without doubt before it's decided one way or the other, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, Assange has done such a tremendous service in the you know name of getting this information out to the public that would otherwise be suppressed. And as you say, I mean, this is what journalists are supposed to be doing, but so much is controlled. And of course, now this is whole case is about can the United States have this global reach to imprison, force countries to imprison and torture really anybody who dares to challenge the narrative the United States is putting forward. So I really appreciate all the work that you've been doing for so many years on this through Consortium News. And we just have to keep fighting for Julian Assange. Thank you, Margaret, for having me on. Thank you.